Hello YouTube! Just recently I got recommended a video called This is why you don't have a demon back. And I clicked on it expecting it to be complete garbage because usually the type of people who make these clickbaity videos about how to get huge rows back tend to be teenagers who spend more time watching anime than doing pull-ups. But this time, I was actually presently surprised because the video was actually quite good. It was full of very solid training tips that any new lifter should be following if they want to optimize their back gains and avoid the most common mistakes. So before we even start with this segment, I want to give a big props to the author of this video. His name is Random Fitness and apparently he's only 16 and he already gives better advice than most adults on YouTube fitness. So congratulations. I recommend if you are his age or getting started with lifting that you go check out his channel. I'm going to place a link in the description. With the amount of teenagers on drugs nowadays who give horrible advice, it is a breath of fresh air to see someone who is sticking to the basics and who is able to give good advice even at such a young age. But what I want to do today is take this opportunity to go a step further because even though his video was really good, it was full of basic tips for people who are getting started. And I want to be able to, in a sense, augment his work and follow up with more advanced methods and things that he might not have mentioned because of his low training age. So I'm going to leverage my experience with back training to tell you the things that you might want to avoid the more you progress and the bigger you become. What to pay attention to, how to modify your training based on your strengths, weaknesses, etc, etc. So let's begin with something very important, which is the anatomy of the back. In his video, Random covers the multiple groups that you need to target if you want a demon back. And unlike many people who think that you only need big lats to have a demon back, he understands the importance of the traps, for example. So that's already very good. The issue is that this advice can sometimes lead to more mistakes down the line because many novices, upon learning that the back is indeed made up of multiple different muscle groups, short circuit in a sense, they go crazy and they start doing a gazillion variation for every single area. And that is just as counterproductive as the type of people who only do deadlifts for back even though they are neglecting most of the back in reality. The two are extremes and they need to be avoided. So even though yes, the back is a complete and complex muscle group, it does not require multiple variations per area. It is much better instead to pick one to two exercises and then get strong at them using relevant rep ranges. You also, of course, want to avoid rotations and variations all the time. If you switch exercise for your lats, for example, every two months, chances are you're not going to see results because times and times again, you'll have to relearn the pattern and you're never going to get those hard reps. You're never going to have to fight through these plateaus that at the end of the day would give you your gains. So once you have selected the movements that you enjoy, you pick a rep range that is going to be relevant for you and you try to get as strong as possible on these movements while getting as much volume as possible. So these are my preferred rep ranges, three to five, for pull-ups is excellent. A five by five will also work. Three by threes are good as well. For other types of variations of pull-ups, a six to 10 is possible. Barbell rows, same thing. Three to five is excellent because you really want to push the intensity on these, but many people are not confident in their technique. On the barbell row, in which case you do a six to 10. Six to 10 is also great for hip hinges that are also included in developing your back because a lot of people seem to think that good mornings, that uh, Romanian deadlifts only grow your glutes and armstrings. They do in priority, but they also thicken the fuck out of your erectors and rhomboids. So you really want to be doing them. If you're the type of person that only does pull-ups, for example, you'll have decent lats, but when you turn around, you'll look like a piece of paper. And that's not very impressive. Keep in mind that Ujiro's demon back is 3D, it pops, why? Because it is thick. So you want to get thick as well, you want to do your hip hinges. Then eight to 12 is my favorite for pull downs and all sorts of dumbbell rows, legless rows, cable rows, sole rows. I find that it is a good 
amount of reps to really push the muscle to failure. And then stuff like real delts, isolation for example, shrugs, 10 to 15 is a good rep range for that. These are my preferred. Now, most exercises that you will be doing that I just cited, don't just train one muscle. It's all something to keep in mind to prevent yourself from panicking at the thought of leaving gains on the table. If you look, for example, at a pull-up or a pull-down, they don't just train your lats. They also train the terrace major and minor, as well as other muscle groups in the back. A cable row or a dumbbell row will train your traps as well as your lats and your real delts. All of that to say that it's a package deal. Then you have, of course, the barbell row, which, if done properly, trains the entirety of the posterior chain and the entirety of the upper back. Does it mean that we then go to the other extreme and say, okay, well, let's just do barbell rows then? No, we use all the tools that are available to us, but we don't exaggerate. No need to do everything and no need to be paranoid about developing lagging muscle groups. Also, and this is my personal opinion, there is no need to dedicate specific training slots to lower back simply because most of your hip hinges are going to train that area already. So unless you have restrictions or injuries, there is no need to take like one to two lifts added to the training just for that muscle group because it's going to be developed by your heavy pulls and your heavy hinges. And the same is somewhat true for glutes, although that is not the topic of this discussion. Now, in relation to forearms, however, this is not the same. Many young men, many novices think, okay, well, back training and back day is also forearm day because I pull with my forearms and I use my grip. So there is no need to isolate my forearms. Then five years down the line, they have small forearms and they have a small back. Why? Because when you follow that line of thought, it is the worst of two woods. Not only is just pulling things not enough to develop the forearm because it doesn't cover all of the functions of the muscle of the forearm, but worse, you are now letting the weakest muscle of the upper body limit the strongest muscle of the upper body. And that is criminal, do not do that. So my advice for you is very simple, strap up. As soon as you hit that one set where your grip fails, don't think about it twice, buy straps. It's going to save you so much time and it's going to get you much bigger, much, much faster. There are a few exceptions, of course. You don't have to strap up for every back movement. I find that stuff like pull downs don't require straps. I see people use straps sometimes. Usually movements where the hand is going to grab a bar and allow the fingers to wrap around in opposition to having the bar dangling from your body with a straight arm tend to be much easier. I don't quite see how it's possible to have grip limitations on these. Likewise, if you do a diagonal pull, so let's say you go and you grab the bar here, usually you can force grip the bar, in which case there should not be an issue with your grip because now you're literally locking the implement and the bar in place as you pull with your elbow. Once again, not to say that you can never use straps, but if you become the type of person who uses straps on everything, one, you depend on them, and two, there's not really a reason because yes, indeed, gripping things is going to give you free forearm gains. So why not get it if you can get it? But it's not enough to just stop there. If you really want to train grip, instead of just trying to get it as a byproduct, which usually doesn't work, just train grip, which is also, again, going to grow your forearms. And don't get swindled in a sense by these bodybuilders who tell you that if you don't strap up, you somehow limit the ability of the back to recruit muscles because the central nervous system is occupied with the forearms. That makes no sense whatsoever. It's bro science and the worst type of bro science. I think that you should use straps whenever you want and don't use them when they're not necessary which should, of course, never prevent you from also training from directly, you should isolate every single muscle group. And this idea of strapping up also applies to hinges and deadlifts. Please do not waste your time with mixed grip or even worse hook grip. Hook grip is a skill that you have to develop. It hurts, it has to be kept up. For what reason exactly? Keep in mind that hook grip was first and foremost invented for weightlifters because they're not allowed to use straps. But you're at the gym, bro. You're trying to get big. No one is there to tell you that you don't get to use straps. So use straps. There is no point in developing these other, uh, these other strategies of grips. And in relation to the deadlift now, it might be shocking to some of you guys to hear, 
but I also really advise you to not obsess over it. I understand you have been told at some point that the deadlift is the king of exercises, and that is true only in the sense that it recruits the most amount of muscles at once, but that doesn't make it better than other movements, especially for back development. If anything, it makes it worse because it means that it's going to fatigue the shit out of you and now you don't have energy left to hit other muscle groups. And the reason why I insist on this is because you can tell from the video that Random is young and that he's still somewhat influenced by this big three powerlifting dogma because he insists a ton on the deadlift. But I can tell you that everyone that I know and that has, uh, that has moved on to pure bodybuilding now vouch for the fact that hyperfoxing on the deadlift, especially conventional or sumo for many years has been a massive letdown because they did not get the back development they expected from it. Sure, they got good erectors, good traps, but these things could have been developed with any other hinge. There was no reason to over-focus and in reality obsess over that one movement, especially since, again, there are better use for your energy. So if you're the type of person who deadlifts three times a week, I highly recommend you only deadlift one time a week and then you spend that leftover energy doing pull-ups or rows instead. And if you do decide to do pull-ups, please do them properly. There are many people nowadays who have recognized the supremacy of pull-ups. Pull-ups are indeed actual kings for back development. Between someone who is going to train deadlift and someone who is going to train pull-ups for a year, I think that the guy with the most aesthetic back at the end will be the guy doing pull-ups. But he might be less thick than the guy doing deadlift, which is why you want to do both your hinges and your pull-ups. But yes, if you do your pull-ups, there are three rules that I want you to follow to make sure that you get gains from it. The number one is your negatives should always be slower than your positives. Always. There is no if, there is no but. Always. Why? Because if you do not follow that rule, you're going to do what I see pretty much everyone do. You're going to just drop. I see people doing explosive positives and then they just drop and they let their arms catch them at the bottom. But the issue is that most of the gains you'll get from the pull-up happen as you try to resist gravity when your body is going towards the ground, as your arms extend, as the lats stretch to catch the weight. That is when the gains are made. So if you just completely skip that portion of the range of motion, you're skipping the gains. There is no point. And why do people do this? They do this because they want to lift as much as possible. So they think, well, lifting for the pull-up is just the positive, right? That's one rep. Wrong. That's 0.5% of the rep. That's 0.5 of the rep, 50% of the rep, and not even the most important part. So please slow down your negatives. And to do that, I have a very simple trick, and that's my rule number two. Every single pull-up starts from the top. You do not start from the negative from the, the bottom of the negative, you start from the top of the positive. That is one rep. You're at the top, you extend all the way down slowly, then explode back up. That's one rep. Okay, so five reps would be doing that five times. That way you will not cheat because by opening with the negative, one, you set yourself up for success because your technique is going to be much better. And two, you open with the most important part of the lift. So now you're going to reinforce that mentality in your head and you're going to see much, much better gains. And on top of that, as I said, it's going to make your technique better. The third rule and the thing I want you to do is you want to stay underneath the bar when you do pull-ups both during the negative and as you explode back up. Again, I see many people who end up pushing their bodies back and trying to climb over the bar. So they end up away from the bar, like in a curve. Why do they do it? Because you are much stronger when you do that because you're pulling with your arms. So in a sense, you tend to skip the top portion of the positive and completely take the back out of it by placing your elbows in front of your body instead of outside. By being here, it pushes you away from the bar. If you are here, the bar could be aligned with your body. Always keep the, line, the bar aligned with your body. You are only separated from the bar in that line when your head passes the bar if you want to go that high. That's it. When you go down, most of the range of motion needs to be under the bar. And I insist on this because the pull-up is a back exercise. So if you constantly push yourself away from the bar, you recruit less lats and you recruit much, much more arms. 
please follow these three rules. I understand it's going to make you weaker. You will automatically lose reps and weight on your weighted pull-ups, but you'll get much better hypertrophic results. And then the fourth thing, and this is optional, dead hangs, in my opinion, are not necessarily needed. I know that some people like to teach them. I find that the stretch at the bottom is simply not worth it because it's a passive stretch. The active stretch of the range of motion is what matters. If you have a preference for dead hang pull-ups, do them. It's not an issue. But make sure that if you do your dead hangs, you don't do all of the things I just mentioned. Because, and this is why I insist, every time I see someone do a dead hang pull-up, they also do these three cardinal sins that completely kill your gains on the pull-ups. So don't be that guy and do your pull-ups properly, please. Then regarding uh, progressive overload for back training, you of course want to focus on getting stronger. And since the back is a very strong area because it's made up of many muscle groups, you'll find that you'll progress super fast and you'll move a ton of weight extremely quickly, but never do so at the detriment of technique. It is absolutely true that increasing strength is essential to get bigger, but it is possible to get stronger and see no results whatsoever in terms of size, simply because your technique has went to shit. Your form has gotten sloppy and therefore you think you're getting results because the weight keeps getting up and up and up on the bar, but it's because your technique is starting to really suffer. And again, the pull-up is a great example of that. People who start treating the pull-up as like a performance exercise and they stop looking at their form, but there are other offenders like the Barbaro. The barbell row is the easiest lift on earth to mess up because without realizing it, you'll more and more start to hinge into the movement because you'll find out instinctively that it makes you stronger and you can lift more weight. So you'll start adding plates upon plates on the bar. And then you are rowing two plates and you look at your back and you're like, wow, I'm very small. And this guy is rowing one plate and he's like twice my size. What the fuck? Is he on steroids? Well, maybe, I don't know. But what I can tell you is this, maybe it's because he's actually doing rows and you're doing a hip hinge. So of course, you're not going to see the results that you want. Then you have the lat pull downs. I'm going to a commercial gym now. The amount of people who I see cheat on the lat pull down blow my mind. Well, their back literally does this as they do lat pull down. And I'm looking at this thinking, okay, if you wanted to do an horizontal pull, you know that there's a cable right there, right? You don't need to matrix yourself into the horizontal plane to then pull to your like belly button. This is completely stupid. A lat pull down, just like with a pull up, should be done aligned with the cable so that you can pull directly into you. You never lean back and you certainly do not place your arms in front of you like I see some people do because it makes the movement easier, but you recruit less back. So stick to a form that you know is proper and then add weight to that. Do not change the form. Think about it this way. Your muscles get bigger because they adapt to the stress that the weight puts on them. By increasing the weight, you increase the stress, which also increases the size of the muscle. That is fair and that works. However, if the method you use to put on the stress and to move the weight changes, then you can no longer be certain that the increase in weight and stress will result in an increase of muscle because the technique is now too far removed from what it used to be. And so you are literally adding weight for nothing and you're lifting for no gains. So always make sure you standardize your reps. It's completely useless to possibly overload if your reps, technique and tempo are not standardized as well. The two go hand in hand. And I think that this is what you should take to heart in reality, because you know, there is no secret to back training. There could be some tips and some, some hacks that I just gave you in this video that are going to prevent mistakes and are going to push you on the right path. But all of this will not matter if you don't actually apply it. You see, people have been making videos on how to get a demon back for what a decade now. And how many people do you see with impressive backs? The back is the most undertrained muscle group and it is the one with the biggest potential because most people fail to apply for a very long time. I find that the naturals with the best backs are the ones in their 30s to 40s because they've spent a lot of time on that back and they've been hammering it. Since it is a big muscle group, it's going to recruit, it's going to require the most volume and so the most amount of training as well. So start with random's advice and then the more you train, the more you progress, start to learn, start to apply more advanced tips because to get to that next level, it's what is going to be needed. 
and it also doesn't stop there. Yes, what is needed is to apply and to put in the work, but for that, you need a plan. You can't just do things randomly. You can't just go in and spam every single back exercise or back machine that you see inside. You have to properly split every single back exercise that you have chosen and the volume that comes with it evenly. This means no back day because again, many novices, when they receive that type of advice, which is good advice, they do something with it that is bad and they think, okay, I'm going to do all of these back exercises to cover all of my bases, but I'm going to do them all on the same day for some reason. Like as if there was some God in the sky of muscle splits that has decided that a back day is a back day and that you are not allowed to do back exercises on every other day. Dude, Instead of doing your six back exercises on Monday, how about doing two on Monday, two on Wednesday, and two on Saturday? You will find that the gains you'll get will be much better. On top of that, you'll be able to run what I call a synergistic plan. So for example, you can take your traps and your posterior chain and train them on the same day because most likely your hip hinge and your heavy pull is already going to train these muscle groups so they will be pre-fatigued, they will be pre-exhausted and easier to train. You can also do the same with lats and biceps. Hey, you want a big compound movement to start your day? Do a heavy weighted chin up and then both the lats and biceps are already primed to be worked as well. This is what I mean by synergy. Then you have muscles like the real delt that suffer even more from this rigid split mentality. The real delt don't need to go on a shoulder day. If anything, they go horribly on a shoulder day. The real delt are best trained on a day where you don't train anything else. Any other muscle group that could connect to the teres major and minor or the other heads of the shoulder. Try something for me. Put your real delt work on your lower body days and tell me how much you can push these, these sets of real delt. I guarantee your progression is going to skyrocket. So this is also something to keep in mind. Then we have my favorite lift, the pullover. I say, please do your pullovers, do your dumbbell pullovers. And if you're lucky enough and your gym has a machine pullover, do them. Worst case scenario, you can do your cable pullovers as well. Keep in mind that if you only have cables in your gym and you don't like the dumbbell variation, you can set up a bench with a low pulley to do your pullovers in that fashion. That is absolutely possible. Some people even do it on a decline bench for even more stretch. So that is very interesting. But where should you put it in your program, right? Right now we're discussing how we planify back training. Well, I find personally that pullovers pair best with push days. They pair really well with vertical pull, uh, ver vertical presses and horizontal presses. So give it a try as well. But if you want clearer instructions and you want a detailed step-by-step -step plan, you have two choices. Either you check out the pin comments. I'm going to put my back master plan in it. It's a, I think, four-step plan that details exactly what you have to do. So year by year by year, it will tell you exactly which steps you have to follow. Then if you are looking for exercises to train the traps or the lats, I made two tier lists that will also be included in the pin comments. And lastly, if you want a plan that is already designed and you don't want to have to think, you can also check out the description. There's my Toji program. The Toji program is a V taper program that focuses on the back and the shoulder. So this should be good for you as well. And that is going to conclude this video. So once again, if you have not checked out Random's channel, I recommend it, especially if you're young. I think it would greatly benefit you and YouTube fitness as a whole. If someone like him who seems to have a good head on his shoulder and who understands training principles even at a young age could get a big audience that way, teenagers would follow people like him instead of other teenagers who take trend and who train like complete fucking idiots. And as for myself, I am going to wish you a good rest of your night. If you've enjoyed the video, you can always uh, support this channel on coffee. And I hope that my advanced tips to get a demon back were of use. Thank you for watching. Have a great rest of your day.